Hello, I'm Kathy Bollinger from the Local History Department of the Community Library of Allegheny Valley. I'd like to welcome you to our library's presentation, Who Knew? History of Quilts. Let's begin. The history of quilting dates back as far as 3400 BC in ancient Egypt. As early as the 12th century Europe, Crusaders wore quilted garments under their armor for protection and warmth and to prevent the armor from rusting. Several earliest surviving quilts were made in Sicily around 1360. Both of the quilts surviving were what is known as whole cloth quilts, one white work surface, not pieced, and embellished with a puffy decorative method of quilting known as trapunto quilting. One quilt is in the Victoria Albert Museum in London and the other is in the Bargello Museum in Florence. Here is a picture of the Tristan quilt in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. North America's quilting traditions crossed the ocean with the first immigrants. Quilt making was common in the late 17th century and early 18th century. In colonial America, most wealthier households had the leisure time for quilt making. Thrifty colonial women recycled precious fabric scraps to make and repair garments and bedding. Any quilts they made were decorative quilts that displayed the fine needlework of the maker. The Industrial Revolution dramatically changed how quilts were made. By the 1840s, the broad scale production of a variety of fabrics saved women from spinning and weaving their own fabrics and gave them more leisure time to quilt. The 1846 invention of the sewing machine gave even more time to quilt and made finishing a quilt much faster. Here's some examples of some early quilts. The medallion quilts, 1830. Baltimore album quilts, sometimes known as friendship quilt from 1840 and the Civil War Soldiers Quilt around the time of the Civil War. Here's a little quilt trivia. Singer Sewing Machine Company started an installment plan so more families could afford their sewing machine in 1856, and by 1870, most households had a sewing machine. Here are some examples of Amish and folk art quilts that have been featured on the past U.S. postal stamps. Leading up to the American Civil War, quilts were made to raise funds to support the abolitionist movement. Some abolitionists were active along the Underground Railroad and helped runaway slaves get to safety. Some stories suggest certain quilts were used as signals to help slaves in their flight to freedom. For example, a log cabin quilt might be hung on a clothesline of a safe house. Today, some historians dispute the accuracy of these tales. Civil War quilts were made by women on both sides to raise money for the war effort, as well as give warmth and comfort to their soldiers. Even though cotton was primarily grown in the South, Quilt making now was more difficult in the South because the fabric was manufactured in the North. Let's take a look at the Underground Railroad quilt codes. In the top left is the log cabin block. This pattern showed enslaved people where safe houses or stations were located. Next, the shoe fly block. This pattern showed enslaved people who the helpers or the railroad workers were. Bow ties. This pattern told enslaved people that someone would bring them nice clothes so they could blend in at their new home as freed people. <laughs> 
the North Star block. This pattern told enslaved people to follow the North Star to Canada where they could be free. Tumbling blocks. This pattern told enslaved people to pack up their things because they would soon be called to escape on the Underground Railroad. Monkey wrench. This pattern told enslaved people that they should collect all the tools they might need while traveling on the Underground Railroad. And finally, flying geese. This pattern told enslaved people to follow migrating geese wherever they fly to Canada during the spring and summer months. In Canada, the enslaved people could live freely. G. Ben's quilts are one of the most enduring examples of quilting as a result of the Civil War. Joseph Gee was a slave owner, and in 1816, he established a cotton plantation in an isolated and rural community known as Boykin, Alabama. When he sold his property in 1845, slavery remained. But after the emancipation, many family members stayed on as sharecroppers. In 1930, when another person took over the land, they lost their food, animals, and more. Lacking many of the necessities to live, like electricity, quilts became an important part of keeping the community warm. Here we see an example of the basket weave quilt from 1943 and a photo in a home of a quilt being sewn in 1937. The early 1900s brought about the crazy quilt. Using the waist knot philosophy, many different fabrics and shapes were quilted together, embellished with decorative stitches. Here is an example. The Great Depression of the 30s popularized the feed sack quilt. Animal feed, flour, and other staples were packaged in cloth sacks and a variety of cheerful prints. Here are two examples. The one on the right is known as the Sunbonnet Sioux Block. The 1970s marked a quilt revival, thanks in part to nostalgic interest in vintage crafts. Quilt festivals, museum displays, quilt contests, quilt classes, time-saving tools and techniques, especially the rotary cutter, began changing quilting worldwide. Quilting now became a popular hobby with an estimated base of 21 million quilters. For more quilt trivia, the most expensive quilt ever sold at auction brought in $264,000 in 1991, equivalent price today, 501661 The largest patchwork quilt ever made in two, was in 2000 and measured 270,174 square feet. That's more than 54 times the square footage of the White House. Quilling bees originated in the Midwestern United States during the 1800s when a lack of neighbors and a need for socializing drew women together to make a new friend and to finish their quilt. Almost every state has a quilt museum or a local museum with a quilt collection. Here are two of the largest, the National Quilt Museum in Kentucky, which opened in 1991, and the International Quilt Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska, opening in 1997. This museum houses the largest publicly held quilt collection in the world. Quilt groups are a great way to share your passion for quilting and to learn new methods. One of the largest and longest running quilt guilds is the Three Rivers Quilters, based in South Hills. They've been active for the last 30 years. They offer monthly meetings and workshops for all levels of quilting. New members are welcome. Each year they sponsor an annual quilt show. 2020's show was a virtual show, but scheduled already for 2022 is a show at the Meadows running from April 5th to the 9th. 
For more information, check out their website, threeriversquilters.org. Many churches in the past have had quilting groups, but as of now, the only local active sewing and quilting group is a group at the Holy Martyrs Catholic Church in West Turenum. Other resources for quilting information or workshops, look to your local quilting shops, sewing shops, and stores. This is a quilt from the Three Rivers Quilters Guild Annual Quilt Show 2016. It is a quilt featuring one of the Pittsburgh's many bridges. Our library has sponsored a quilt show for the past 22 years, beginning in the winter of 1999. Our new library building had just opened in the fall of 1998. This year's quilt show is virtual due to the pandemic closure to in-person visitors. You may view the quilt entries on our library website, AlleghenyValleyLibrary.org. You may vote for your top three quilts online through January 23rd. Winners will be announced on January 26th. Here are a few examples of some of the quilts from past shows. You can view all the entries from past years at our website, under the Adult tab. Thank you for viewing our Local History's Who Knew presentation. Programs are offered monthly on the third Tuesday at 6 p.m. If you enjoyed this presentation, join us next month for Who Knew All That Jazz, February 16, 2021 at 6 p.m.